webinar. So what I want to talk to you about is to focus. And when I say focus, that means drop your email account uh, down on your desktop. Don't be checking your email. Put your phone on vibrate. Better yet, just turn it off or stick it in your desk drawer. Get up and go close the door of the room you're in. Don't let anyone interrupt you because this is your time to pick out two or three things that are going to help you make more money. So I want you to focus. Get a pen and a piece of paper. Get ready to take a lot of notes because you're going to get some great stuff out of this. Now, I told you I just started using Webinar Jam a couple of months ago, and uh, we've got a lot of pollen in here. here so my uh, allergies are acting up. I, if I clear my voice too much, I apologize for that up front. But I want you to focus on the webinar today. I'm going to talk about our role as sales professionals. I'm going to cover the seven criteria for a qualified prospect. These are my seven criteria. Doesn't mean they have to be yours. But look at these seven criteria and see what your criteria is for a qualified prospect. And when I say a qualified prospect, I mean somebody that I'm willing to do a full and complete presentation with. I'm going to talk to you about why stories matter. Not scripts, but why stories matter. And then we're going to talk about when does the close begin? Because it might begin when you don't realize that it begins. Then we're going to go through the four basic objections. And we're going to talk about rebuttals and closing examples. And I'm going to give you specific rebuttals and specific closing examples. And these, this isn't theory. This is the ones I've used. So imagine you're sitting down with a client. And they tell you, after you spent an hour, hour and 15 minutes with them, they tell you that this sounds great, but that they want to think about it. And imagine that you're able to respond to them in a way that as you're responding, they nod your head. You make eye contact with the wife. You make eye contact with the husband. And they say, you're right. How do we do this? Imagine yourself in that position. Because that's exactly my promise to you today. That's what I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you how to frame things in responses in a way that your prospect says, how do I do this? Listen, let's go through some sales myth. We were all told, every, every broker you get hooked up with, every carrier you get hooked up with, every manager you work with over the years, every training you've had, they always tell you that we just have to overcome the objection. If you overcome the objection, that you're going to make sales, right? If you overcome the objections, you're going to close business. We were told that if we just use the right rebuttal, right? The right rebuttal. And, you know, you, you see those guys get up on stage at the annual conventions, big million-dollar producers, and you think, man, if I just had their script, if I just had their close, if I just had the answer to the objection the way they do it, I could be them. If I just had the right close. But here's the thing. We know that just because you have those things, that doesn't mean they're going to buy. Because that's what we're told, right? If you just use this, then they'll buy. And they don't. Time after time after time. So if you've been down this road, then you're obviously here today because you now know that stuff doesn't work. We don't need more training. We need better training. And my promise to you is that's exactly what I'm going to give you today. So as we go through this, I'm going to ask you to answer some questions by typing in the chat. Don't raise your hand because uh, I'm not going to do that on this, on this call. But just type in the chat box as we go through this. So I want to go through the secrets with you. Our purpose as a sales professional that's the first secret I'm going to tell you, is our purpose as a sales professional and the impact we have on our prospects. Because it's really important to understand our role in the selling process. And it's really important to understand the impact other salespeople, ineffective salespeople, have had on our prospects. Then we're going to talk about the four basic objections that all objections fall into, those categories that they all fall into and how we can understand them and reduce or eliminate 
all those objections. And the third secret is the number one purpose for you using a rebuttal. And then the type of closes that clarify the reason your prospects buy today. You have to clarify the reason our prospects are buying. So that's my promise to you. I'm going to show you these three secrets. Purpose of a sales professional, four basic objections, and how to clarify the reason your prospects buy. So let me ask you this. If I show you how to use a simple step-by-step -step method that gets your prospect to share their biggest concern, illustrate that exact concern that they expressed, and then respond in a way that they can choose the exact solution they want, while helping you gain more wallet share, then you should put into practice at least one insight that I share with you today, if it's right for you. Does that sound fair? Type in the chat box, let me know if you, that sounds fair to you. Because what's the purpose of being on the webinar if you don't walk away with at least one concept that you're willing to use? So just type in the chat box and let me know that you'll, you'll, pick, you'll find at least one thing that you will go out and use to make a difference in your business. All right, good, good, good. All right, uh, before we go any further, I want to do a little poll here and just take a minute to answer these questions because I want to make sure that I handle uh, the objection and I give you the rebuttal and the close uh, for what uh, you're running into the most. So just uh, go ahead and answer the, the question right there. Which objection do you run into the most? And then, um, and then I'll end the poll and show everybody what the results are. I'll give you just a minute to put that in there. Everybody's answering. It looks like we've got two primary ones that everybody runs into. Two primary ones. There may be one that we run into that we didn't know we ran into it, but maybe. So there's no money, no need, no hurry, no confidence. Just whichever one you run into the most. Which one? Which one interferes with you capturing that commission, you capturing that client and building your, your client base? All right, I'm going to end the poll. All right. So it looks like that no money is 48, 45% of everybody said no money was the biggest objection. The next one was no hurry. And the next one was no need. So we're going to look at those. Thank you for sharing that. We're going to look at each one of these. Um, let me go back here. All right. Now stick around to the end of it, and you're going to get your free download, and that's a handling objection uh, worksheet there. And uh, I think that that's a, a, a worksheet that you're going to be able to take with you, and it's going to have some, a, a summary of everything we talk about today. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm only going to tell you a couple of minutes. You can look me up and find out about me. But uh, So I started with John Hancock in 1977, that picture of me in that plaid coat and the striped tie, which I don't know why the heck I wore that. I think I was 22 years old when I started with John Hancock. I left them a few years later as a sales manager uh, and uh, went over to Combined Insurance Company. That's me in the middle there. I was a field trainer with them, uh, and I used to sit down every Sunday night and spread out my leads. I spread them out by zip code and routing numbers and hand them out. I ran my own agency for a long time. Uh, that's me right there, the right-hand side with the, the uh, sunglasses on. Ran my own team. Uh, I worked inside a home office of a, a large insurance company. Uh, for a long time, I ran the career distribution shop for American Republic Insurance Company. Uh, we did $65 million a year in business at 2,000 agents out in the field. I ran a call center. So what I do today, most everything I do today is, is uh, training. I put on seminars, workshops. Um, I speak at events all over the country. I've been interviewed by uh, Scott Drake with Annuity News Now. I've been interviewed by the Well Channel through American College. Um, I speak at events, Unite 2018 for the American Association of Inside Sales Professionals. I spoke last year at the 10th Annual Medicare Supplement Summit in uh, St. Louis. I'm also speaking at the 11th Annual Medicare Supplement Summit here in Atlanta, Georgia, just in a couple of weeks. So if you're in Atlanta, drop by, man. We'd be glad to have you there. Um, I write articles for a lot of industry-related magazines. So I've got articles coming out all the time. I have an article coming out in 
uh, Think Advisor magazine. I've got an article coming out uh, next month in Insurance News Net magazine. Um, a lot of carriers use my material. Equitrust used my article on whole life as a wealth transfer tool. And you can connect with me on LinkedIn. I invite everybody to go to LinkedIn and, and uh, connect with me. I love to connect with people. I have a large network. If I can help with anything, I'd be happy to, uh, to do that. Has anything really changed over the years as far as dealing with prospects? That's a great question, Don, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into that. They just do not qualify, Tom said. I agree with you on that. Well, let's dive into this, okay? Let's, let's jump in. So the first secret, our purpose as a sales professional and the impact that we have on our prospects. Our primary function is to disturb people. Now, I know some people, you know, I want to tell you right now, don't take offense where offense isn't meant. It's just my philosophy. But our job is to disturb people. If you don't disturb people and remove their complacency, they're probably not going to make a decision to make a change in their life. People don't like change. And people don't like to be sold. So we have to uncover the sources of their dissatisfaction. We have to instill a desire for changing the status quo. And when we do that, when we successfully do that, then we have to offer an intelligent and acceptable solution. And that's what affects a decision for them to buy today. That's our role. Those are the primary functions of our job. Our job is not to sell a product. Now, selling includes selling yourself. You know, our prospects don't give a darn about our, our company. Uh, they don't care how much we tell them that we're a professional until they see us as the type of person that they're willing to share personal information with. And it's only after they see us as, as the type of person they would be willing to meet with that they even care about having an interview with us. So it's actually in this order. You have to sell yourself first, then you sell the interview, then you sell your professionalism, and then you sell your company. Because you have to do those first three things before they care about your company. Everybody, every prospect, every agent tunes into WIIFM radio. That's what's in it for me. See, what we have to do is we have to think from the perspective of our prospect in order to help them uncover information that triggers their buying motives. In other words, we have to think like they think. You know my brother-in-law, Jesse Sloan. Yeah, I know Jesse. Yeah, very. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. All right, great. Well, Robert, good to see you, my friend. I'll, I'll be with Jesse in a couple of weeks from now. We have to think from the point of view of our prospect. We have to understand the way the prospect buys. And, you know, salespeople do this all the time. Salespeople sell the way they buy. We figure the price of a product or service, and then we look at that price for that product or service. And if we can't afford it or we wouldn't be willing to pay for it, we tend to project that issue onto the prospect, assuming they buy like us. And, of course, they don't. So we have to understand the way the prospect buys. I don't believe in that nonsense, treat the customer the way you want to be treated. I believe you treat the customer the way they want to be treated. And Robert, I'm going to touch on what you just said. Robert said, I sell the solutions. I'm going to touch on that in a minute. But, you know, simply understanding the prospect's buying motive doesn't accomplish anything. We have to figure out the buying motive, and then we have to use the motives to help the prospect buy. That's the that is the key skill that we have to develop. So, you know, I've worked with a lot of really, really great salespeople. They understand the product really well. They're really great at opening conversations, but they struggle at closing. And one of the reasons why they struggle at closing is they're selling the way they buy. And you've worked with managers like that. You've worked with managers who train the way they sell. So they think you should sell the way they sell. Now, here's my definition of the seven criteria of a qualified prospect. And here's what I mean by that, okay? I, you know, first of all, I'm an old door-to-door -door guy. Now, I, you don't do that as much anymore, but I was, I'm an old door-to-door -door guy. Combined insurance company, we went door-to-door. -door. Uh, and over the years, I just made it a policy that I don't make a full product presentation to anyone unless they meet these criteria. And the reason for this is because I actually see myself is as a value. Think about it like this. Think about you don't think about going to a doctor and you don't feel good. And you explain your symptoms. So you say, I've got a headache, 
a sore throat, my body aches, I've got the chills. And you go to Dr. A, and Dr. A says, um, okay, Don, uh, I know what's wrong with you. You can have this medicine, you have this medicine, you have this medicine, you have this medicine. Which medicine do you want? And you go to Dr. B, and you describe your symptoms. I got a headache, sore throat, I got the chills, my body aches. And Dr. B says, okay, Sally, I, I know what's the matter with you. Write your prescription out, hands it to you, says, take that, fill it, take it twice a day, come back and see me in, in 10 days. Which doctor do you have more confidence in? Type in the box. Which doctor do you have more confidence in? You know, most people have more confidence in Dr. B. And the reason they have more confidence in Dr. B is because Dr. B diagnosed the problem and prescribed the solution. My counsel to you is be Dr. B. See, I was always Dr. B because I only gave a full presentation to prospects that recognized they had a problem. I only gave a full presentation to prospects that were motivated to solve that problem that they recognized. I only gave a full product presentation if they felt that my product or service would solve their problem. They could qualify for my product or service. They had the money to purchase my product or service. They were willing to spend the money to purchase my product or service. And they were willing to spend that money to purchase my product or service today. Now, I've got to eat in October. So I get that. That's why people do, do uh, buybacks. But i got to eat today. So I'm not going to invest all of my time with a prospect unless I know they meet this criteria. Because it's only these prospects that I have the best chance of closing. And I'm there to make a sale. I'm there to help prospects solve a problem. So when does the close begin? Well, the close begins with the very first contact. Remember I said that you have to sell yourself first? You see, people buy an emotion, but they're moved to action by logic. So always think of the end that you're looking for. And listen, even people who say they buy logically buy that way because of how it makes them feel. People buy an emotion and move to action by logic. If your end result is the prospect becomes your client by making a purchase, then would it seem reasonable to talk about the solution as if they already own the solution? You say, I think what you want to do, I think you want to sell the problem people have, not the product that you're selling. And the way you sell the problem that people have, because 70% of people make a buying decision to solve a problem. 30% of people make a buying decision to gain something. So I think that you sell the problem people have, not the product you have. You see, people don't think in terms of information. They think in terms of narratives. Narratives are inherently more engrossing than facts. Narratives have a beginning, a middle, and an end. When people are telling you a story about something, if we get sucked in early on, then we'll stay to the end of it. When you hear a good story, you tend to hang on every word, don't you? Stories carry things. They carry lessons. They carry morals. You'll see that in the rebuttals I give you today. And beyond stories, think about other ways that people could acquire your information. They could do it by trial and error, right? It's costly and time consuming. They could go through a lot of other agents. They could try direct observation. In other words, they could watch a bunch of videos. I had, I did a phone call with somebody yesterday that wanted me to use consumer-facing videos, like I could send my uh, customers to a web a landing page and they'd watch a video and call me back and go, ooh, I want to buy that product. Well, it didn't work that way. Uh, you could use advertisements, and, and I advertise all the time. I'm a believer in advertisements, but you know, people don't always see advertising as trustworthy. There's a lot of noise out there, and people are skeptical of being persuaded. Stories solve this problem. Stories help people acquire knowledge in a vivid and engaging fashion. Stories give people an easy way to remember information. You're going to see that in the rebuttals today. People are less likely to argue against stories than advertising. That's why I like stories. People can identify with stories. 
First, it's hard to disagree with a specific thing that happened to a specific person. So if I'm telling a story about something that happened to a specific person, it's hard for someone to argue about that, that it happened to that person. And second of all, we're so caught up in the drama of what happened to Mary that we don't have the cognitive resources to disagree. You'll see that in some of the words I use in the rebuttals I show you today. Stories give people an easy way to talk about products and ideas. And stories are other ways to give people a reason to bring information up other than triggers. So here's the second secret. The four basic objections that all objections fall into and how understanding them can reduce or eliminate all objections. And I say the four basic objections. There's really only four basic categories that any objection falls into. So you look at it this way. Think of any objection you've ever run into and tell me if they don't fall into these four categories. No money, no need, no hurry, no confidence. In fact, that's the survey I asked you earlier, right? Almost every objection you've ever run into falls into these four categories. No money, no need, no hurry, no confidence. So here's the thing. The same reason people don't buy are exactly the same reasons they will buy. They will use it. They can't afford it. It is worth it today. They do trust you and your company. So once we understand what category the objection falls into, it's really easy for us to start including the objection in our sell script and in our rebuttals. But another key is there's two types of objections. There's an emotional objection and a logical ob objection. So there's four basic objections, no money, no need, no hurry, no confidence. There's two types of objections, an emotional and logical one. And it's pretty easy to tell an emotional objection. People will have objections that you have to overcome before you can close them on a particular product. So an emotional objection is always characterized in feeling words. I don't like it. I don't want it. I want to think about it. I want to talk it over with someone. Well, as soon as I say that, I know it's an emotional objection. So example, I don't like it. Immediately, I know that's an emotional objection. And a logical objection is very specific. I'm waiting for a check, lower costs, comparing benefits. So yeah, that's a very specific objection. It's logical. Keep in mind, people say things from their frame of reference and people hear things from their frame of reference. And what we have to do is we have to hear what people are saying, not what they said. So I'm gonna give you a sentence here. And I'm going to say this sentence, and I'm going to show you how this sentence can have different meanings. So it says, I did not say she stole the money. But what if I said, I did not say she stole the money? Do you hear that as a little bit of, have a different meaning on it? How about if I said, I did not say she stole the money? What if I said, I did not say she stole the money? Hey, what if I said, I did not say she stole the money? How about if you heard me say, I did not say she stole the money? And what if I said, I did not say she stole the money? See, I stretched the word stole out. I did not say she stole the money. Might not be that money she stole. I did not say she stole the money. Am I inferring she stole something else? You see, the words that someone uses have to be congruent with the feeling that they're being said with the voice inflection, the way they're coming across. People say things from their frame of reference and people hear things from their frame of reference and that includes you. So now that we understand the four basic objections, no money, no need, no hurry, no confidence, we understand the two forms of objections, emotional, logical. Let's look at the way people communicate. They do it either through statements, questions, or objections. So a statement is a reporting of a fact or opinion. It's neither right or wrong, it's just a fact or an opinion. So what, if someone says something that in their view is not a fact or it's their opinion. A question is a statement that attempts to gain information. Isn't that true? See how I turn that to a tie down question? Isn't that true? 
trying to gain information there. <coughs> and an objection is a statement based on a fact or feeling of disapproval. So what are the three ways people communicate? A statement reports things, questions gather information, and objections disclose information. You see, we have no reason to be afraid of objections. If when people don't object, you probably those are probably the times you didn't make a sale. People have to object in order for them to really dig, dig down and talk about the things that matter to them the most. So statements report something, questions gather, and objections disclose. I love it when people object. So let's test you. Let's give a tester. Get ready to type in the chat box here, okay? Because I want you to answer these questions. So I don't like it. Is that a statement, a question, or an objection? I'll give you a minute to type in there. Remember, a statement is a reporting of a fact or a feeling. A question is trying to gather information. Just type in the box and let me know what you think. Do we have a statement, a question, or objections? Looks like we're getting a consensus here. It's a statement. Good job, Jeff. Rock and roll. Michael, you did great. Robert, you did great. Yeah. The statement is, it's very easy to see that's a statement. I don't like it. It's neither right or wrong. I don't have to have a rebuttal to that. There's nothing to rebut. It's okay for him not to like it. I won't buy it because I don't like the color. Well, what is that? Is that a statement, a question, or an objection? We've already done the statement, so it has to be a question or objection. Is that a question or objection? Type in the box and let me know. Question or objection? You got two choices there. Object, we got objection, we got, uh, let's see, objection, objection, objection. Well, ta-da, it's an objection, yay, good job, Jeff. So I don't like it's a statement, I won't, I won't buy it because I don't like the color. That means car companies don't honor their warranties. You know why I put down here that car companies don't answer the, uh, honor their warranties as a question? Because one time I went into a hardware store in Kodak, Tennessee, and the prospect backed away from the counter and said, I'm not interested in health insurance. You guys never pay your claims. And I didn't hear that as an objection. I heard it as a question. I heard the prospect, like I pulled on my ear, I heard the, and I said to the prospect, it sounds like you had a bad experience with an insurance company. Do you mind if I ask what it was? See, I took it as a question. What they were actually saying is if I buy from you, if I listen to your presentation and I end up buying from you, will you... Um, paid the claim because the other insurance company I had didn't pay the claim. That's what I actually heard them saying. So state, uh, uh, so a statement is, I don't like it. A quite objection is I won't buy it because I don't like the color. And a question is car companies don't honor their warranties. It's important that we hear what people are saying, not what they said. You see, one of the biggest mistakes salespeople make is to try and fight the prospect's objection. That's why I call my training handling objections, not overcoming it. I'm not trying to overcome you. This isn't a push and pull. I'm not trying to get the best of you. I want them to win. I just want to handle the objection. And since I already know what the objection is, what category it falls in, what types they are, it's very easy for me to include the objection in my sales presentation to reduce the chance of them coming up. You see, when you fight an objection, your prospect sales resistance goes up, it doesn't go down. And the buying process just becomes that much more difficult and it's unnecessary. You know, my, what I learned a long time ago, Bob Thurston taught me back with Combined Insurance Company, instead of battling with your prospect, I wanna align myself with them. I wanna reinforce that I'm on their side. By aligning myself with the prospect, you validate their concern, you lower their sales resistance, and you make their objection much easier to handle. <clears throat> Sorry about that, guys. So there's three steps to handling objection. The key here is to be asking questions. The person asking question is always the person in control. Because what's the old adage? Type in the chat box, answer the old adage. The first one who speaks, what is it? Type in the chat box. The first one who speaks, let me see it. I bet I guess what everybody's going to say. Let me tell you what I say. The old adage is the first one who speaks loses. 
Now, I've always thought that was kind of crazy because if I understand the thought process behind this, if I do a sales presentation, go into my close, and I ask the dominant closing question with the awkward pause, and the prospect's the first one who speaks, and them speaking results in them being able to buy my product, and my product lowers their costs, increases their better benefits, protects their family better, and they get a better agent, me, somehow they lost? Isn't that kind of a weird way of thinking about things? I think that the first one who speaks buys. And when they buy, they get me as an agent, they get you as an agent, and they do better, right? So you make a positive statement, an affirmative action, and you close and stay closed. So the three steps are make sure that it's a final concern. There's no point in answering an objection if the answer to that objection isn't going to get you a sale. I'm not trying to win them over. I'm not trying to make friends. If I need a friend, I'll go, I've, I've got a dog for that. Herbie's my dog. I'm not trying to make friends. I'm not saying your, your, your clients aren't, you're not friendly with your clients. But I'm in a sales situation. I'm not trying to make friends. So I'm not going to waste my time answering one rebuttal after another. This isn't a contest of who can uh, come up with the most uh, answers to objections. I want to make sure that I'm at the end of the road before I answer an objection. So I want to make sure it's a, an, a real objection. I want to make sure it's a final objection. I want to make sure I'm at the end of the road, and I want to demonstrate I'm listening. So there's four basic objections. No money, no need, no hurry, no confidence. And the same reason they won't buy, the same reason they will buy, they can't afford it, it is worth it. They will use it, and they do trust you. So we're going to the third secret. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to go into a lot of rebuttals. I told you that's scheduled for an hour and 15 minutes. I'll probably go over it a little bit because I want to cover all these. So the third secret is the number one purpose for you using a rebuttal. And I'm leaving this on the screen for a couple extra minutes. The number one reason for you to use a rebuttal and the type of closes that clarify the reason for your prospect to buy today, that's the reason you use a rebuttal. It's not to get the best of the prospect. You want to make sure you're at the end of the road. You want to provide enough information for them to make a buying decision today. The idea is not to educate them or to consult with them. I'm not there to be a professional visitor, and I'm not a nonprofit. I'm not there because I'm trying to make friends. I'm not saying my prospects won't be friendly. You know, people, have, some people come up and say, well, my, I'm friends with my customers. Well, of course you are. They're your customers. <laughs> I bet the prospects that didn't buy from you you're not that friendly with. Anyway. So the idea is not to educate them or consult with them. Rebuttals are designed to provide you with enough information to assist that prospect and make that buying decision today. It's the whole purpose of it. So let me show you how some of these uh, rebuttals work. Everybody ready? Let's jump into it. First thing I want to tell you is the words in black are bolded words, and those are words that require you to use voice inflection voice emphasis and add personality to it. So the objection is my wife would probably get married. Anybody heard that objection before? If I this life insurance, if I die, my wife would probably get married again. And I'd say, you know, John, that's possible. That, that's a possibility, Bob. And without adequate life insurance from you, she could feel forced to remarry to support your children. Wouldn't you like for her to at least have a choice? Now, let me tell you what's powerful about that. If I'm sitting at a kitchen table with a husband and wife, and that guy says that in front of the wife, and I use that response, that's a possibility, Bob. And without adequate life insurance from you, I'm going to make eye contact with her right now. She could feel forced to remarry to support your children. I'm going to look at her, and I'm going to nod my head. And guess what she's going to do? She's going to nod her head with me. Then I'm going to look back at him and say, wouldn't you like for her to at least have a choice? That's a great rebuttal. I've written so much life insurance using that specific result and that was specific rebuttal and notice what i'm doing i'm using the story of their situation to hone in on what actually happens to them here's another objection there's no hurry we can take it out after the first year well bob your decision's a good one however there are several reasons for putting this into effect right now any change in your health could mean a change in the low rates of this plan 
And by the first of the year, you'll be one, uh, one year older, you know, insurance-wise. And you add the body language to it, insurance-wise. You raise your shoulder, tilt your head, you know, insurance-wise. And by the first of the year, you'll be one year older insurance-wise. We have a short-term premium plan that will fit your situation. Let me show you how this works. Now, that's the clothes that I use on everything. Let me show you how this works. And you lower the octave of your voice when you say that. Let me show you how this works. If you do it properly, they actually lean into you. So you can do convert to a term plan. You can convert to a quarterly premium. You know what? I'm not just in a product turning video. But use that term. Let me show you how this works. Use eye contact when you do it and use voice inflection. We're sticking on spouse insurance. The objection is we don't need it. She will probably outlive me. Now, again, I'm going with the scenario the husband and wife are sitting at the kitchen table together. John, of course, it's difficult to imagine anything happening to your wife. And then I look at the wife and nod my head. Anything happening to your wife? What, am, what, what did I just do? I set her up to be important and I set him up. He better treat her as important. Of course, it's difficult to imagine anything happening to your wife. And I used to think the same way about my wife. But did you ever notice the number of TV shows that have been built around the situation of a widower with children to raise? That's when I make go back with the eye contact with him. These stories make great plots for television, John. But in real life, the usual situation is personal and a financial tragedy for the survivors. And then I look back at the wife. It's a great rebuttal, man. Now, you got to have a little bit of tenacity, a little bit of nerves still here. You stay calm. You keep your, your palms open. You face them directly, and you say it with a soft, direct, firm tone of voice. So let's do it again. We don't need it. She'll probably outlive me. Of course, it's difficult to match anything happening to your wife. And I look at the wife, and I used to think the same way about my wife. But did you ever notice the number of TV shows that have been built around the situation of a widower? with children to raise. Those stories make great plots for television, but in real life, the usual situation is personal and a financial, say I look at the wife, and a financial tragedy for the survivors. See, I nod my head, and they will nod with you. <laughs> it's a great rebuttal. <coughs> Spouse insurance. So I wanna think it over. John, when you ask your wife to marry you, did she wait a while and think it over? If she loved you enough to give you a prompt decision, don't you owe her, and that's when you look at her, don't you owe her a prompt decision on protecting this home for her? So before I go any further, what do you think of the rebuttal so far? Could you see yourself using any of them? Type in the chat box. Let me know if you think you could use any of them. Remember, the words in black are bolded and require voice inflection. I, lo I love doing this in live training because I role play it and I have people actually do the body language that goes with it. Because the body language that goes with it is congruent with the words and meaning. Let's do another one. If I died, my wife would probably sell the house. Have any of you heard that? Any of you heard your uh, prospects say that? If I died, my wife would probably sell the house. And they say it dismissively, don't they? That's what I, I love it when, when husbands give that uh, objection because they say it so dismissively. Yeah, my wife probably sell the house. You know, Frank, that's a possibility. That's, I would put the name first, right? Uh, Frank, that's a possibility. After a year or so, she might want to buy a smaller home. But don't you think she should at least have a choice of action? And again, I make that eye contact with the wife. Say, I don't look at the wife until I get to the word but. But don't you think, and I look at the wife, she should at least have a choice, raise his shoulder up, have a choice of action? And what's the inference? The inference is he's taking that choice away from her. But don't you think she should at least have a choice of action? And I look back at him. With the mortgage paid off, your home would be a financial asset for her. Then I go back to her. Look at her. With a large mortgage, it'd be a liability, wouldn't it? Nod my head, and guess what she's going to do? She's going to nod her head yes, and he's boxed in. All right, let's go to the next one. Uh, re this retirement. Uh, Dixon said, why would she sell the house? Uh, 
because if they don't have life insurance and he's the breadwinner or he makes more money than her, she might not be able to make for the house payment, car payment, utilities. There's a lot of reasons why they sell the house, my friend. Uh, it's a retirement. Mutual funds are a better investment. So I'm selling annuities here. That's what I'm going with. I'm selling annuities here. Right, Jan said, more work, stress to sell, but she can't afford it. She may have to sell. I agree with you, Jan. So let's go with, with retirement. I'm selling annuities, and the prospect says mutual funds are a better investment. And they always say it like, like there's you know like multimillionaire. The mutual funds are a better investment. <laughs> so I say, well, John, how much money have you put into funds in the last five years? Now, usually the answer is none or very little, or they have it done through work or something like that. So how how much how many funds have you put in? Uh, how much money have you put in the funds in the last five years? So whatever he says, $20,000, $50,000, whatever it is. I say, John, first, the difficulty in putting money aside regularly, that's the first difficulty. The second difficulty is the fact that the market fluctuates, right? Market goes ups and down. A good investment means you always buy low and sell high, right? And not even the professional investors have that track record, right? You can look at the husband, or you can look at the wife, but nod the head and put the hand out, right? I put the hand out like that, right? And they go, yeah, because it's common sense. Although I recognize if common sense was common, more people would have it. Yes. Let's guarantee, notice I align myself with them. Let's guarantee your security first, and then you can buy those funds. See, I'm not, I'm not arguing about whether mutual funds are better than annuities. I'm not, dis, I'm not debating that at all. I'm aligning myself with him. What I'm really doing is telling the story about what matters most. All right, let's go with, I'll have Social Security and my company pension. Because, God, I've heard that like a million times. Uh, you know, those, are, those things will give you a livable income at retirement, Bob. But with continuing inflation, it will be a barely livable income. You have a good standard of living. Look around the house like that. Put your hands up like this. You have a good standard of living. And you've worked hard to get it. Again, look back at the wife. You looked hard to get it. And you worked hard to get it. And you're saying that you will want to drop your standard of living when the time comes to really enjoy life? And doesn't that bring up a great story? All right. Uh, let's do one more retirement one. It looks okay, but you'll have to see my attorney. <clears throat> I love it when they say you have to see my attorney because what they're really doing is give me a referral. <laughs> That's a good idea because there are some changes in your will that may be necessary. Let's phone him right now and introduce me. We can arrange an appointment so that the three of us can discuss the details. And today in 2019, I pulled my cell phone out, hand it to him, so let's call him right now. Let's go to the appointment. That way I know whether I've got a serious prospect, someone who's serious or curious. And remember, I can't lose something I don't have. I don't have a sale. I can't lose something I don't have. All right, how are we doing so far? Uh, are these rebuttals working for you? Just type in the box and let me know, yes or no. Can we move on to the next one? So the black words are for voice emphasis. You want to make sure your behavior is congruent with your words. And you want to make sure that you're willing to be the Dr. B so that you don't waste time that people aren't going to buy from you anyway. You can't lose something you don't have. Uh, th this is for a professional. My wife could sell my practice. I've, doctors and dentists tell you this all the time. I've even had uh, people who own uh, auto repair shops tell me this. My wife could sell my practice. Doctor, the book value of your practice is the value of the furniture, equipment, cash, and other property, of course, minus the debts. Since you operate on a cash basis, uncollected accounts receivable will not be recognized, nor will the auditor recognize goodwill, which is your most valuable asset, isn't it? You spent years building a practice that would give your family about 30% of what it's really worth. Is that what you want for them? Notice how I'd furrow my eyebrows, tilt my head, and I would look at the wife. Is that what you want for them? 
All right, let's go to another one. So I've given you some some rebuttals, and let's, I'm going to go to some closes now. These are sample closes. These are closes I've actually used over the years. They work for me great. I love these closes. They're my favorite. I'm going to share them with you. You ready? Here we go. Here we go. <clears throat> a general trial close. So here's just a general trial close. You have to insert it in the situation it's best for. The prospects, and eh, I'm not really interested. I don't need it. I don't like it. I can't afford it. What a, whichever those objections. Remember, no money, no need, no hurry, no confidence. So the general trial close is, you know, John, during our lifetime, we buy many things, cars, televisions, homes. And always before the, investing our money, we consider three things, don't we? Do I need it? Do I like it? And can I afford it? And you nod the head, right? Do I need it? Do I like it? And can I afford it? Regardless of what you buy, you accept or reject a purchase generally based on asking yourself these three questions, right? And now I'm going to do, I'm going to pause right there. You can't lose something you don't have. I'm going to pause right there because I want him to agree. Him and his wife are going to go, well, yeah, that's true. Now let's look at the program you design today. And if you don't know what I mean by you design, go get, get on one of my script courses and, and uh, learn how to put scripts together. Let's look at the, the program you designed today. Do you like the program you designed today? Do you feel you and your family need this program? Do you feel comfortable with the company? Can you handle the cost? Now, what I do is I've written the word like, need, and cost on a piece of paper. And when I say, do you like this program? And they say, yes, I draw an X over the word like. Do you feel like you and your family need this program? And when they go, yeah, I draw an X over the word need. What am I doing? I'm erasing their objection, right? Do you feel comfortable with the company? Well, yeah, yeah, Mutual Omaha is a great company. Can you handle the cost? Notice how I said, can you handle the cost? Raise the, the, the voice octave up on the word cost. Can you handle the cost? I almost make it like ridiculous that you couldn't handle it. Yeah, I can handle the cost. Put an X over it and bam. John, the only time you can apply for this protection is when you're in good health. Let's authorize Mutual of Omaha to review your medical records here to see how you qualify. Notice I said, see how you qualify. So this is a life insurance product, how you qualify. I never say how you, if you qualify, how you qualify. Why do I not say uh, if you qualify? Because I might have a product they wouldn't qualify for on one, but they might qualify for another product. I don't want to rule out a, a potential sale. It's ridiculous. So I want to shop around. Obviously, you have a reason for feeling that way. Do you mind if I ask what it is? And then shut up. Make eye contact and shut up. John, obviously, you have a reason for feeling that way. Do you mind if I ask what it is? You want to make the, what they said more normal than abnormal. No matter what they say, then I go back and say, you know, tell me a little bit about what you're shopping around for so I can give you some information to help you make an informed, intelligent decision. Notice how I said that, to help you make an informed and intelligent decision. I hang those two words out there, informed and intelligent decision. I want to evoke the emotion in him that if he doesn't share a little bit with me, then he's making an uninformed, unintelligent decision. And then I do a trial close by saying, let's start the qualifying process to protect your ability to qualify while you still have a choice to shop around. Now, I, I can also use the exact same thing because I can tell him that uh, we're appointed with almost every major carrier out there. Let's do the shopping now. That's a great idea. Let's do the shopping now. Um, overcome objections. They say they want to talk to the wife. I love this one here. This is a great one. Obviously, you have a reason for feeling this way. Do you mind if I ask what it is? I always ask that question. You'll see in almost every one of these, I ask that question. Why do I ask that question? People like two things. They like to hear their name, and they like to have their opinion asked. I want them to feel like that what they think and what they feel and what their opinion is matters to me, and that I'm listening, that I hear what they're saying as well as what they said. So they say, well, you know, I just don't want to talk to my wife. Obviously, you have a reason for feeling that way. Do you mind if I ask what it is? Then call the spouse. Great. Let's get her on the phone. You can't lose something you don't have. Let's get her on the phone. 
go go where she's at. I've gotten in a car and driven over to where the wife works a million times to get an application signed. Get the spouse info and then schedule the, the appointment with her. But here's my real question. Why'd you make the appointment without confirming the wife's going to be there? Don't make an appointment just to have an appointment on your books. Make an appointment with a qualified prospect. And if it takes both people to make a buying decision and you make and you go see somebody that doesn't have the wife there, that's not a qualified prospect. So, Lloyd, what happens if you get there and the wife's not there? Obviously, you have a reason for feeling that way. Do you mind if I ask what it is? You go right back to that. Uh, they say they don't have any money. Obviously, you have a reason for feeling that way. Do you mind if I ask what it is? So here's another one of my favorites. Suppose you need a new job. You walk into one place of business and are offered your current salary with no health benefits. So this is health insurance. When you get sick or hurt or a member of your family goes to the hospital, your employer won't be able to pay anything towards your medical bills. That's what you, your current job has now, right? And they go, yeah. Then suppose you walk down the street and talk to another employer who offered a job which had the same hours and duties that you have now. He said he would pay you whatever the premium is, whatever the premium for your health plan is, that amount of money less than what you're currently getting. However, he would pay you and then you list everything out that your policy offers. So you draw a line down the center of the paper and you write out their job on the one side, the, the, what the premium is on one side. So he pay you that much money less. However, he's going to provide and you list all the benefits of the plan you're talking to him about. Which job would you take? If they say the job with all those benefits, he just told you he'll pay the premium. So I say, why? And then he'll say, because it gives me all this. That's an excellent choice you have now. That's exactly the choice you have now. And it's a choice you can make only when you are in good health. Let's authorize the carrier to check your medical history to see how you qualify, depending on what you know kind of plan they're getting in, whether they're outside of ACH and stuff like that. So uh, that's no money. So here's the way it, I, I, I did the other one, no need. John, let's weigh your obligation against our obligation. And you write down on a pad of paper, you draw a line down the middle of it, your and our, your need and our obligation. So first of all, your obligation is to set aside, let's say it's life insurance, set aside $200 a month. Our obligation, and then you list all the benefits of the plan. Our obligation is to make sure that your wife receives $100,000, accidental death, waiver of premium, you know, whatever's in your plan, you list all of that out. Notice what I said here. On the other hand, so this says, first of all, your obligation is to set aside. And then I said, on the other hand, our obligation is to pay you, list everything out of there, right? However, if you don't live up to your obligation and set aside $200 a month, then our obligation becomes your obligation. And notice how I put a Y in front of your, our obligation becomes your obligation. And you have to meet these expenses as well as your regular expenses. Certainly the wisest decision here is to set aside $200 a month and let Mutual Omaha pay these expenses for you. Your health is your wealth and you can only make this decision while you're in good health. Let's have Mutual Omaha check your medical records to see how you qualify. <clears throat> All right, let's do another one. No hurry. Have you ever heard that before? They tell you that, oh, no, I'm not in a hurry. I'm going to do this first year. <coughs> Sorry, my, my allergies are really acting on. John, if this were a purchase of a product where a few days wouldn't matter, I'd say fine. However, let me point out that protection of this kind is never on sale. In other words, it'll never be any cheaper. Notice the words that are bolded. It'll never be any cheaper. As a matter of fact, it'll be more expensive and could possibly go off the market as far as your health is concerned. Today, it looks like you're in good health, but before tomorrow, your health can fail. When you wait one day, you may be one of the persons who cannot qualify. Now, I love this part here. You got you to gotta be a little gutsy to do this one. Remember, Tony, you take the chance. And this is when you turn and look at the wife. But when you lose, your family pays. You look at the wife and nod your head. That's a powerful close, man. And then you... I, 
I've used that close up a million times. And the, the way you say it, the voice inflection is critical. Today, it looks like you're in good health, but before tomorrow, your health can fail. When you wait one day, you may be one of the persons who cannot qualify. Remember, Tony, you take the chance. Then I look at the wife, but when you lose, your family pays. And I nod my, I tilt my head and nod my head at the wife. And she's going to go, that's right, buy that policy. <laughs> Let's move on this. And I'm going to rescue him. Notice how I rescue him right here. Let's move on this now while you're in good health. So they say, I want to think it over. Obviously, you have a reason for feeling that way. Do you mind if I ask what it is? Specifically, what are you going to think about? Features, the benefits, or the cost? Notice how I stretched each one. The features, the benefits, or the cost. Notice how I did the awkward pause of each one of them. There's two decisions to make. The first decision is the home office has to make a decision. They're willing to accept your risk, your health as a financial risk for the company. And then I tell them the whole, what the whole process is. They do that with the information we put on the policy today. The way you know they accept your risk is they issue the policy. You'll know they issued it because I will call you and schedule an appointment to bring. So that's the first decision. Um, then then the, so I, I'm sorry, I should let me go back to that real quick. Then the second decision, then I tell them well, when I bring the policy out, then you get to make the second decision, which is whether to keep it or not. So that's how I do the, the two decision close. All right, uh, I need to show this to my partner. I love it when they say this because they hang themselves. Get them under the ether. That's perfectly fine, John. I think you should show this to whoever they say needs it, their, their bookkeeper, their accountant, their lawyer, or whoever. I don't care who it is. That's perfectly fine, John. I think you should show it to your lawyer. And let me ask you something. If after you show this to your lawyer and they say it looks, it looks good, whatever you want to do is fine, is this something that you would move forward with today? If they say yes, if they say yes, I'd move forward with it today, great. Then I take it you're going to recommend this to your lawyer, right? And they go, wonderful. What can we do to make sure they agree with us? So maybe they need to see the accountant, the CEO, somebody in another department, whatever it is. So that's the way I would handle that. Easy to handle, really. And you notice all this, all this goes out in story fashion, right? All this is in story fashion. All right, we're coming up. <clears throat> we're coming up on an hour, but let me ask you: Do we have time to to go through a couple more? I want to show you a few more rebuttals. We have time. Type in the box and let me know that you're willing to spend a few more minutes with me. I'm going to take a drink while you type in there. Just say yes if we've got time. I've got just a couple of more I wanted to share with you, but I want to make sure you're okay with uh, with doing that. All right, everybody's saying yeah. All right, all right, all right. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> these are just miscellaneous. They apply to a whole bunch of different stuff. The objection, what's the rate for term? Inflation makes permanent a poor buy. People ever told you that before? <laughs> I like it when they think they know what they're talking about. What's the rate for term? Inflation makes a poor buy. Well, you know, Bob, if you can tell me when you're going to die, I can tell you what kind of life insurance is the best buy. Your estate need for money is a long-range problem in terms of short-range solution. The IRS will not be concerned about inflation or deflation. All they want to know is whether your heirs have the cash. You like that? The objection is, uh, I've talked with an agent who said he will give me a discount. Can you do this, something like that? I love it when they, and they always do it accusatory, right? It's just a stall. It's just, a, they just don't have the guts to say no. It's just a stall for it. I've talked to an agent who said he'll give me a discount. Can you do something like that? Why didn't you bother to buy from him right then? See, I, I'm going to call him on that because by now I've spent an hour with him. You're wasting my time. They, no, we're not going to do that. We're not getting away with that. Why didn't you buy from him? I'm not going to be rude. I'm not going to be rude. Why didn't you buy from him right then? You didn't buy from him because you know, as well as I do, that you get what you pay for, right? The only way an agent can discount the premium is to discount the benefits. And that's not what you want for your family. And who do I look at when I say that? Da -da, the wife. And if I'm with a, a single person, then I make maintain eye contact and shut my mouth. I don't look around, I don't fudge it around with my hands, I don't fudge it with the paperwork. I make the, the only way in here, I'm gonna do it for you. 
The only way an agent can discount the premium is to discount the benefits. And that's not what you want for your family, is it? See, I just did that straight look. The behavior matters. Um, I don't believe in life insurance. Neither do I, Alan, but I do believe in the benefits. It's not like the customers of the paint store in the next block. No one buys paint because they like paint. They buy it because they want the results of painting, right? Insurance is really money. Money for you when you're too old to work and money for your family. Look at the wife. Money for your family when you die. You do believe in money, don't you? So I would do, you do believe in money, keep my eye contact on the wife. And when I say, don't you, go back to him. You do believe in money. You do believe in money, don't you? Because <laughs> when I break eye contact with her and look at him, guess where she's going to look? She's going to look at him also. I love it. With Christmas coming, we just can't afford it. That's really what we're talking about, isn't it, Tom? Christmas for your wife and children, if you're not here to give it to them. Christmas for the years to come. Isn't it? Will this monthly premium take away from their happiness or are we guaranteeing it to strong close? All right. Now what I'm going to tell you is don't ask problem questions. So be aware of questions which don't ask for immediate action. It's questions like, is there anything else you'd like to know? Have I made everything clear? Uh, <clears throat> now do you have a good understanding? Can I leave a brochure with you? I work with a guy one time, I always leave a brochure with everybody. <clears throat> Can I leave a brochure with you? When did you want to get started? I sold a $100,000 annuity one time. Had a 10% bonus when you started annuity. I sold the annuity because I asked the lady when she wanted to start getting her 10% bonus. Guess what she said? Now. <laughs> I didn't say when do you want to get started. I said when do you want to start getting the 10% bonus? She said now. So don't ask, don't ask questions that don't indicate you expect them to take action. These kind of questions raise that doubt. And, and here's some truism for you. It's hard to justify the cost of something if you don't see the value in it. What does the prospect have to do when the value exceeds the cost? They have to buy, right? That's what they have to do. When the value exceeds the cost, they have to buy. So I told you I'd tell you three secrets. Our purpose as a sales professional and the impact we have on our prospects. Four basic objections that all objections fall into and how to understand them can reduce or eliminate all objections. I, I think I covered that for you. And the number one purpose for using a rebuttal and the close, the type of close that clarify the reason your prospects buy that. Did I show you that? Type in the box and let me know, yes or no. Do you feel like that I delivered all that for you today in this webinar? <coughs> Do you have a good understanding of those three Secrets, can you see yourself using those? Do you feel like that I covered that for you? Because I have a question for you. If all this makes sense to you, I'd love to continue working together. Is it okay if I show you a way for us to work, continue working together? All right, now let me do that. I know we're running up on a, an hour now. We've, we've got an hour, but I created a course called the Advanced Senior Sales Training. Because I think that you should sell the mistake. You should sell the problem people have, not the solution that you have. Sell the problem people have. Sell the mistake they have going on in their life, not the product. People aren't interested in your product. Remember WIFM Radio. What's in it for me? They're interested in them. Sell the problem people have, the mistake that's occurring in their life. And then tell them about the solution. So the Advanced Senior Sales Training Course has a seven-step sales presentation. You heard me go through part of it today. It's got 11 lessons in it. And those lessons are the, include the approach and how to sell off the wall, the handling objections. We went through some of those today. The qualification, how to qualify the prospect. You don't want to waste time with people who aren't going to buy from you. You need to be Dr. B, not Dr. A. Uh, we talk about handling objections in the qualification. I go through how to gain the commitment with people, how to actually make the sales presentation, to do the pre-close as a part of the presentation. The close, I already showed you an example of the close in the uh, sample closes I did today. And then how to get referrals. And it's not the stupid way you've been taught. 
there's a way of getting referrals where people actually give you names. Because I already know what happens now. I already know. You have to, people, who do you know I can help with their life insurance? And they say, I don't know anybody. It's a ridiculous way to ask. Well, I, I show you the, the proper way to ask for referrals in there to get names. And then I'm going to give you the scripts that work. I'm going to show give you the exact scripts that I use for life insurance, Medicare supplements, health insurance, all kinds of scripts in there. 23 lessons in there. Give you the basic phone approach, how to use your voice, uh, scripts for direct mail, prospecting, final expense, Medicare, uh, handling customers' insurance objections. I even include, because I do training in a lot of different industries, I even include scripts for merchant accounts because I work a lot of people who sell financial products and credit card processing. And the reason I include those scripts is to show you that the psychology of handling objections, the psychology of the sales process works no matter what industry you're in. So I think it helps you to see the way scripts are put together in other industries and compare those scripts to the scripts for the insurance industry and see that when you follow the psychological principles, they work every time. Then you get my library. These are recorded webinars I've done on sell annuities, fast track coaching, all kind of stuff in there. So uh, the, when you get inside the course, you get video. So you get video of me going through it. You get downloads. And you get text. So when you get this course, you're going to be able to get rid of being an unpaid consultant. Somebody told me on here in the chat box already that they hate being an unpaid consultant. You get rid of being a professional visitor. I, you know what? If, I, if you need a friend, you should get a dog. Sales is not for people who want to make friends. You get rid of call reluctance. Objections over price. Clients who say they don't know anyone to refer you to. That's nonsense. If they're on a bowling team, they, already, they at least know the people on the bowling team, right? Da -da. Struggling with needs assessment. Struggling with prospects to take action. In fact, you'll stop being with prospects who don't take action. Struggling with what to say to close business today, because that's when I make money is today. Jesse Sloan said, Lloyd's an exceptionally talented sales and sales training executive. He's very effective, charismatic, and motivating speaker to any size group. Lloyd's presentation at the 10th Annual Medicare Supplement Summit was described as a powerful presentation. Thank you, Jesse. He's a, he's a great guy. So let's uh, talk product value, you know. How do I price this out? I mean, I just want to make enough to, to pay for my expenses. I'm not trying to, like, get rich off this. <clears throat> so I spoke at the um, the Lead Generation Summit. The whole summit was $1,297. But if you just took my lesson, they charge $197. So Glenn said, thanks for the quick reply, because I always reply to my emails. If you email me, I'm going to reply back to the email. So thanks for the quick reply. Very impressed with your session with the Lead Summit. I just ordered your book, Leads to Result. So that's $197. So if you go through a one-hour training, that's $197. I do a lot of training with Lorman Education Centers. So uh, I just finished a training for them, learn to identify and eliminate costly sales habits and replace them with tried and true strategies to boost your professional career. So how much do they charge? How much do they sell my training for? They sell it for $105, and if you want the recording in the workbook, it was $140. So if I round it off, $197, $140, if I round it off, and, it, and I charged $100 for each lesson, which would be fair. I mean, that's what people pay out in the marketplace already. Then 11 lessons and 7-step sales presentation would be $1,000. I mean, if I just sold each one of them through Lorman or any of the dozen other places I sell courses through, I could make $1,000. If I sold the scripts, 23 scripts at $99 a piece, that's $2,277. This course that I'm offering you and I put together just for you is three, that worth $3,366. That's not a guesstimate. I'm not blowing smoke. I'm, I'm showing you this exactly what I could get for selling each individual lesson. So here's my question. If you could get this kind of help to stabilize your business, build a reliable income, and increase your sales consistently for the rest of your career, career would that have been we be worth an investment to you? Type in the chat, chat box and tell me if you think that would be worth an investment to you. I do this training everywhere. They're always one-hour trainings. 
So yeah, I spent uh, 10,040 years, 20 times 500. <laughs> I know I've been there. I've been to all of them, man. I've been to Dell Carnegie. I've been to Zig Ziglar. I've been to Tom Hopkins. I've been to all of them in my career, man. Uh, here's the deal. You get my 11 lessons. They're worth 1089 bucks. You get my scripts course that works, 23 of them. For $2,277, a $3,300 value for $494 today. Janelle said, Lloyd, I have gained so much insight from your expertise in such a short time. Thanks for giving back your time, knowledge, and mastery. Your training does a great job of breaking down the process and buying behavior especially well, particularly for a newbie like myself. But it gets better for you. I have a special bonus for those of you who decide to jump in today. You're going to get my one-minute coaching videos. And I'm going to put this offer out there in just a minute. So you get my one-minute coaching video, more than 50 uh, podcasts that you can download and have with you every day. And you can listen to these podcasts when you have a problem at the time you have a problem. So you can see the systematic approach to sales, advantages of a straight line method for amortization. I've got 50 all different kind of topics in there for you. I'm going to include all that in there. That's the rejection versus objection, what the difference of that is. They make all that available for you. <clears throat> Those podcasts on iTunes are 10 bucks a piece. That's worth $500. Everything for $494 today. Mike O'Neill, he's a financial advisor. Lloyd has helped me overcome a number of my struggles. And best of all, it's been really easy to understand and implement his guidance. I have his content and style very much, and I always learn something new that I can use. And I appreciate that. Now, listen, you've got two choices. The first, don't, don't do anything. It's okay. Don't take advantage. Don't take this leap of faith. But here's the thing. If you make the same choices and have the same behavior, in the next 12 months, you in the last 12 months, in 12 months from now, you're going to make the exact same amount of money. And if that's okay with you, then you're doing good. No, no problem with that. But the second option is pony up this small investment today compared to all the value you get and just give it a shot. I mean, you deserve that. But I got another bonus for you. You're going to get all my webinars. Every members-only webinar that I do, you're going to have access to. Now, I said everything's $494 today. That's seven-step sales presentation course, 11 lessons worth over $1,000. Scripts course at work, 23 script lessons worth over $2,000. The bonus fast-track coaching, download this podcast, $500. The quarterly live webinars, you get all that, $3,800 value, $494. Now, Mike Zena says Lloyd knows his business. He's a consummate professional. He's a fee-only certified financial planner. Diligent in his practice and has a flair for making it fun. I've learned how to be attracted, better attract a tribe, engage them, and keep them coming back for more. If you want more engagement from your prospects, talk to Lloyd. And I really appreciate it, Mike. I've got one last surprise for you. You're going to get everything at 50% off. So not $494. You're going to get everything at $247. I'm putting the offer out for you right now. I'm publishing it right now. Just click on the link below. Click on the link right there on your screen. It says power behind the sale. Start handling objections now. Just click where it says I want my 50% off. You get it for $247. And I'm giving you that to you because I recognize that you gave up the chance to earn a commission to be on this call. And you gave up the opportunity to be with your family to be on this call. And you deserve it. I wanted people to do this. Nothing irritates me more than to get on a webinar and they want me to spend two or $3,000. I don't know you. And I'm going to give you two or $3,000 you're a moron. This is a more than reasonable price. You get a ton of value out of it. And you get access to me. So I will answer your emails. You can go to my website, lloydlofton.com, and schedule a 15-minute uh, uh, consultation with me. I do that all the time. You get 50% off. Just click on the, the, the link right there on the, the side of your uh, uh, screen. I want my 50% off now. You get the seven-step sales presentation course worth over $1,000. The script, scripts at work course, 23 scripts, worth over 2,000. The bonus fast track coaching worth 500 bucks. You get the quarterly live webinars. 
Skipper Pond with the Pond Insurance Agency, working with Lloyd was extremely instrumental in my development in the health and life insurance business. If you ever get a moment to share time with him, you'll come away with so many essential nuggets within the insurance industry. And I really appreciate Skipper. He's still a good friend of mine. He's down in uh, North Carolina. <clears throat> you get a 30-day money-back guarantee. You can access your free download. So let me put that download out there for you. You can access your free download. There's your download. Click on the download file. You can get that free download. You're also going to get an email with that download in it. So when you click on the link and you, you pay, then you're going to go to this site here, and that's going to take you, you enter their user ID and password, and that's going to take you right inside of it. So there's your offer. Tim Turner, uh, he invented the first online calculator. I do a lot of work with him because he has retirement calculator software, and we do, do a lot of work together. Tim said, Lloyd is someone who really gets it. Too often I run into people that are not very knowledgeable and don't bring anything to the table to speak, but not Lloyd. He's a well-spoken, knowledgeable expert in numerous financial areas, products and services, and most of all, how to sell them. He's an amazing teacher that keeps audiences captivated and engaged, and he does that almost effortlessly. If you need a speaker, a sales trainer, or a consultant to help boost production, you won't ever regret hiring Lloyd. And I really appreciate working with Tim. So everything $494, but you get that 50% off coupon. So it's only $247 today. So you jump on it today, click on the link right now. I want my 50% off now, and you can take advantage of it. Listen, we don't need more training. We need better training. And I don't give you theory. I talk real life experiences. And I can take your questions. People email me their scripts all the time and I help fashion that script. I can help make all of this stuff suitable to your sales personality. You can't sell the way I sell, just like I can't sell the way you sell. But I can help you find your better voice. Rachel said, Lloyd is one of the most knowledgeable and effective sales training managers I have worked with. I always look forward to his training sessions because of his unique, no-nonsense teaching style and the vast amount of knowledge and sales skills he brought to the table. Lloyd's fresh ideas and perspective always made perfect sense, and his tips and techniques were easy to apply to my day-to-day -day conversations with prospective clients. I would highly recommend his training sessions to new or veteran agents. So we're coming down to the end of this. You can nail this. You can have the consistent income you deserve. The reason why the salespeople's commissions go up and down, you have this wave of commissions, is because you have this wave of activity. You can solve that problem. You can have a steady work stream without overworking yourself. You can hit your goals every month. You can have certainty of your workload. So you can project three months out and know exactly what you're going to make. And you can have access to all the coaching you need to get past all those barriers and have a 30-day money-back guarantee. I mean, what do you have to lose? So you get the seven-step sales presentation, 11 lessons, scripts at work course, 23 script lessons. The bonus fast track coaching, 50 lessons. The bonus quarterly live webinars. And you get direct access to me. You can email me. You can go to lloydlofton.com, schedule a 15-minute conversation with me anytime. I always take those calls. Just click on the link right now. It says, I want my 50% off now. So I've got some questions that came up. I'm going to try and answer these questions. I know we really kind of ran over, but I'm going to try and answer some of these questions. Um, how long does access to the training last? You get it for the, you know, the entire year. And the reason you get it for the entire year is because I'm constantly adding and updating things in the training site. Uh, Lloyd, my biggest challenge is finding warm prospects. That's, that's my biggest challenge. Okay. You know, I get that. But here's, here's you know, don't take offense where offense isn't meant. Uh, agents tell me this all the time. I need more qualified prospects. And maybe, maybe we do. But maybe what we need are more qual prospects to qualify. Maybe if we quit ruling people out and start ruling them in, then we could convert them to warm prospects and from a warm prospect to a qualified prospect. Remember, I only make a full sales presentation to a qualified prospect. 
So I get that you have tr your biggest challenge is having warm prospects, but you know, I would challenge you and inside the training in, in the training, when you go through the training, one of the things you're going to, you're going to see is the training there where I talk about putting together your business plan. And one of the biggest mistakes I, I see agents make is they frame questions to rule people out and not rule them in. Uh, Lloyd, well, this will take practice. Great foundation. Thank you. I appreciate that. It is a great foundation. And, you know, the great thing about a foundation is once we have the three legs on our stool, that stool's strong enough to stand on. If you only have two legs and you stand on a stool, you're going to tip over. Uh, sell the problem. Uh, you know, I, I know. I, I, I don't. If that works for you, I think you should stick with it. My personal belief is you should sell the problem people have, not the solution. So I agree with you. You sell the problem. I'm not saying the solution or the product doesn't matter. But the solution or product's about us. The problem's about them. When I'm talking about a solution or a product, I'm talking about me. I want them to be interested in what I have to say. When I'm talking about the problem, I'm talking about what's happening in their life. I'm talking about the story of their life. That's why I say sell the problem people have and tell them about the solution. Don't sell the problem. I mean, don't sell the solution. Tell the solution. And you know when you'll be able to tell that solution? It's when you sold the problem because they'll ask, well, what do I do about this? Uh, Lloyd, key question statement on the phone to separate myself from every other caller. You know, I love that. That's a great question because I don't think you should compete with anybody. I think you should separate yourself from anybody. Now, remember, the very first thing I said about selling yourself is to sell yourself, right? You don't sell your product, your service, your company, your professionalism. The first thing you sell is you. And the way you sell you is sell them on the fact that you're interested in them. So, for example, seniors. I don't call up seniors. Listen, I'm turning 65 next week. I'm turning 65 next week. I've got a million phone calls. The phone calls are all exactly the same. Hi, hi is this Lloyd Lofton? Did you recently call? Well, I understand you're turning 65. Uh, have you gotten plan A and B yet? We can save your money on your meds. That's the script everybody uses. Everybody uses the exact same script. They could call me up. Hi, Lloyd. I understand you're turning 65. The reason I call is a lot of my customers are having questions about some of the proposed changes in Social Security and Medicare, and I want to see what questions I could answer for you about either Social Security or Medicare. What, which one met, bothers, bothers you the most? Which one do you have the most concern? They're talking about me. Isn't that great? They're talking about me. Somebody actually asked what I thought? Wow. Shocking. Um, it's all about the cash flow for me right now. That's a hard one because, you know, I don't want anyone to, to not have enough money to pay their bills. But if you if cash flow means you don't want to put it on your credit card, um, here's the question I would ask you. If you had an appointment to go to or you had to take your kid to a doctor's appointment or you had to go to a meeting, and that's, that's a good one. Forget the doctor's appointment. That's kind of cheesy. If you had to go to a meeting at work, and if you didn't show up at that meeting at work, you were going to get suspended. And you had a flat tire. And you called somebody to come fix your tire. And they told you that the sidewall was busted and you had to buy a new tire. And the tire cost 100 bucks. Would you make the meeting? Let's say, you're, let's say your spare tire didn't work. Would you make the meeting? Because if you would charge that new tire on your credit card, you should probably do this. But now, don't do it if you're not going to do the work. You know, don't Again, don't take offense where offense is meant. But if you're not going to do the work, if you're not going to actually use the lessons and go out and practice and make mistakes uh, and get embarrassed and get dry mouth. And if you're not going to do the work, then yeah, cash flow might be more important. But if increasing your skills, if increasing your skills to capture lost income is important, then I think you should just pull the trigger. But do whatever you feel like is best. I, I support whatever decision you make. I would say being compelling with our tightening up and turning the prospect off. Yeah, that's true. That's a, that's a big problem. We, when we talk about us, and they, and they do it all the time, I can save you money, I can get you a better product, I want to help you. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about me, I'm not talking about them. I, 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 talking about me. The because is a pre-frame, it's very powerful. I love it that you picked up on the because. We were raised on because and now, right? You're up in your room, your parents tell you, come down to dinner. All right, let me, I just want to finish this game, I just want to finish this game. And they say, no, come down to dinner now, right? Now, now. Or you say, why do I have to come? Why do I have to rake the yard now? And they say, because I told you so. So we were raised on because and now. That's why I use it all the time. I need a good question or statement to, to make the prospect 
want to buy. That, that's in the course. I've given you a bunch of examples. I'm not trying to brush you off, but I, well, I've just gone way over the time here. <clears throat> Get the course. Uh, Bill said, top-notch, Lloyd, as always. Thank you, Bill. really appreciate it. Dan said, pay rent or buy this. I'll buy this. Can't disagree, my man. Can't disagree. Sally said, do we also get notified of the ongoing webinars for members, or do we need to be proactive on the site uh, every so many days? Well, I think you ought to be proactive. I think you should come back every week and go through a different lesson. As soon as you think you've got the lesson down and you've gone out and practiced it three times, then you should come back and go through it again. But no, you get an invite. I, I communicate with the members. You get an invite to it. And Jill said, I pulled the trigger. No matter how seasoned, we're always investing in ourselves and advancing your terrific partner and resource. And this is a no brainer. Thank you. Well, Jill, I really appreciate that. So I went through a bunch of questions. Uh, I'm going to go back to the chat box for a second. Does anybody have any, uh, any last questions? If you want to type it in there, uh, what's in it for me or the hell with you? <laughs> You're so funny. You're so funny, Robert. Uh, okay. So any other questions or comments? All right, I think I've answered most of them. I'm going to put the offer back up there for a second. Uh, 43 years. I'm never too old. Exactly. Exactly. My session kept breaking up. Is there a replay? You'll get a, you'll get an email with a link to the replay. But, you know, just pull the trigger. Let me put the offer back. Pull the trigger and get, get the course. You deserve it. You should have that. Right there it is. So I'm going to leave it up there for a quick second. I really appreciate you guys being on here. $247. Put it in your credit card. You got more than enough time to go out and make the money to pay for it. I mean, seriously, what is that going to add? Another two dollars a month to your 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 payment? It's nothing. You make that back with one sale. Even if you just sell a med sup, you're going to make double that amount of money back. There's no reason not to do. You'd spend more than that on a direct mail drop. Cost more than cost four hundred thirty five dollars. I mean, seriously. I mean, that's that's less than ten telemarket leads. To 10, 10 telemarket leads at a minimum 25 bucks. And and you'll be able to take those telemarket leads and do a heck of a lot more with them. So, you know, I'm not going to sell you. I really appreciate you being on the call. It's been almost two and a half hours. I mean, an hour and a half now. So I'm going to log off. Appreciate the time, guys. You're going to get an email after this that will also give you a link to the replay and the offer. Should come in two different emails. Um, really appreciate your time. Loved working with you. Thanks for interacting. You guys are great. Uh, if you want to talk to me, go to lloydlofton.com, click on schedule a, 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 a call, and then schedule 15 minutes, and uh, I'm more than happy to visit with you. And my email address is right on the email, lloyd at lloydlofton.com or lloyd at power buying the sales. You guys have been great. Have a great Memorial Day. Don't drink and drive. Be safe. Get the course. Spend at least five hours in the next three days going through that course. You'll be glad you did it. Talk to you later.